Good to be here, always good to be here. Welcome to my second video of my little series called Matt's Wuthering Art, which where I talk about a single work of art, and this gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, an individual painter or individual art movement. And I take as a starting point my traveling explorations uh, and the encounters that I have with works of art in the different parts of the world where I am, especially at museums. And on this video, I'm going to try something a little different. This is the third video of the series. And the artist I'm going to be talking about is one that I was not familiar with at all. And uh, his name is uh, Valentin de Boulogne. And he was a Frenchman from the Bar Baroque era who died in Rome. And, um, well, uh, before I get started on him, let me, talk, let me say something about the Baroque era. The Bar Baroque era and Baroque art emerged in Europe and the 17th century to the mid 18th century. So it started in the early 17th century and pretty much faded out into later uh, art movements in the middle of the 18th century. And uh, of course the major artists and the most influential and the most popular possibly artist of the Baroque era is Mich Michelangelo Merisi, better known as Caravaggio who is noted for his shadow play and for the vivid colors and for many, and for the naturalism of his depictions and for all of these things, the, 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 what else, the exuberant contrasts and all of these things that the Baroque era is really defined by. Um, but uh, uh, according to many of the texts that have been left behind, according to many critics and according to uh, contemporaries of de Boulogne himself, it was de Boulogne who was considered to be the most loyal of his disciples. De Boulogne never, I don't think, met Caravaggio because he arrived in Rome in 1612, which was about two years after Caravaggio had died. And he arrived in Rome uh, under the recommendation, possibly, of his mentor, Simone Vouet. Uh, but, um, but still, Caravaggio's uh, influence is definitely to be found in the works of, uh, of De Boulogne as we will see in the paintings that I will talk about, and actually I will focus on just one of the two paintings that I saw here in Perugia at the Galleria Nazionale dell'Umbria in the Palazzo dei Priori, which is just a few meters from where I'm recording this video. So, um, right, De Boulogne, where, where was I? Okay, so, what kind of a place was Rome at the time in which De Boulogne arrived? Well, what we know is actually, for, a lot of it is from the, Carava the legend of Caravaggio himself, the life story of Caravaggio, who was just as influenced by the religious uh, events that he depicted in his paintings as he was by the incredibly vivid nightlife of Rome, which was populated by prostitutes and drunks and, in one word, sinners. So, and uh, just like Caravaggio put those sinners and prostitutes in the paintings that he did, uh, without perhaps the church even knowing about it. Um, I see the rogue traits of those people in the paintings of De Boulogne and I immediately recognized it when I saw him for the first time here in the Galleria. And, um, and that leads me to think that aside from the shadow play and the style itself of the paintings of De Boulogne, another comparison, another very strong comparison between De Boulogne and Caravaggio is that it lies in those rogue traits of the lower classes that have nothing to do with the pleasant appearance of, say, a Perugino. But I will be mentioning Perugino in this, um, in this video again. But in the meantime, Perugino's traits were a lot more pleasant and more appealing to the, the upper classes and the clergy. So uh, in uh, de Boulogne's work, I guess it had a lot to do with the tastes of the time had changed and people wanted a little more drama, you know? And so that's what the Baroque era brought. But in the works that I saw at the Galleria Nazionale del, del the Lumbria, I saw those rock traits and they excited me to the point that I wanted to find out more about this artist whom I'd never heard anything about. And this is what I, what I saw from the paintings. The paintings that I saw were done at around 1620. One of them is, um, what is it? Christ and the Samaritan Woman. And the other one, which I will be focusing on, is Noli Me Tangere. Noli Me Tangere, it both actually are depicting scenes from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And Noli Metanger in particular talks about or represents the moment where the adulteress Mary Magdalene sees uh, the resurrected Christ and upon recognizing him she says Noli Metanger. And that's the title of the, um, of the, of the painting. But 
the first thing that aesthetically strikes, of course, is the similarities between this work and the shadow play of Caravaggio in the style of, let's say, a Saint Francis of the French, right? But because I was in the Galleria, I was drawn to the comparison between this painting and the painting that I talked about in the first video of this series, uh, series which is um, Perugino's Dead Christ. And that's because the background in both paintings are almost imperceptible. In fact, while in Perugino's Dead Christ we see the sarcophagus at the bottom of the, of the painting, um, we don't see anything in De Boulogne. So, well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really notice anything in particular about the background or anything that would suggest the location of the painting. And yet, they both take place at around the same time, you know, it's the dead Christ, and here we see Mary Magdalene meeting the resurrected Christ. Uh, so what, what does this background mean? Well, some of this I already suggested in the first video. The lack of a background really puts the emphasis on the figures of the painting. It really puts the focus on them. And therefore, it is up to them to communicate the, the events, the story, and the emotional charge of the events and the story told in the painting. Uh, to, the, to the spectators. It's really up to them. But because the composition is very static, a lot of that uh, relies upon the, the light play that we see in the painting. The light is, uh, focuses in on different parts of the body and, and accentuates certain expre the expression of the faces, the empathy in the faces of the Christ and Mary Magdalene. And so that's very exciting because um, on the one hand we see that there is more emphasis placed on, the, on uh, the melancholic figures, but on the other hand, a lot of that emotion comes from the diagonal light play that had been influenced by Caravaggio, right? Uh, so, so, but, but uh, another thing about the lack of background is that it just makes the entire thing look a bit more timeless because the information that is usually provided by props and background is not is kind of absent in this work. And so what it makes me think is that this timelessness reflects an interest that might have driven uh, the artistic motivation of De Boulogne, which is not only to depict the incredible stories of the New Testament, the Old Testament or whatever, but also to depict the scenes of the everyday life uh, and the society that was all around him. We must remember that around this time, and for a very long time, many artworks that were commissioned and that have made it to this day and therefore have been safeguarded had very little to do uh, with this interest. I mean, there was no such thing virtually as a work of art that was just art for art's sake. Um, usually it had a religious, it, it represented something religious or whatever. I mean, it was just uh, always motivated by similar such things. Uh, here, um, we, we, we see, though, that, well, the only example would have been noblemen, you know, the portraits of noblemen, but here, who, Boulogne, de Boulogne seems to ex be depicting the people who are part of the nightlife that would definitely not have had enough, any money to commission the work. So it's almost as if he took great delight and great, uh, yeah, just was delighted in the fact of being able to document the faces of the nightlife of Rome at the time and this, these sinners and these uh, prostitutes and drunks and poor people and so on. So there's two, the, the, this painting works on basically two planes and stuff like this really excites me. After all, you know, one of the things that I guess is not really talked about as much about the Baroque era is that to me, it was really the first major art movement that we know of that place that, that put a lot of trust in the spectator. I mean, it said, it, it left a lot of its uh, uh, the aspects that would have been obvious in other art movements on set. So it was up to the spectator to come up with their own conclusions about a specific artwork. Um, you know, that's what the shadows suggest, is that there's a lot left on set and there's a lot of reading between the lines that you can do in the works of the great masters of the Baroque era. But after all, mystery is actually a bit that, a little thing that connects um, these two paintings with what I've just said. Because um, while we know that, for example, Noli Metangere was made in and around 1620, we don't know to this day who commissioned them. So maybe we could be watching a work of art for art's sake, as well as an underrated masterpiece, in my opinion. So it was really exciting for my third video to talk about an artist that I didn't know much about. 
Uh, it was exciting to talk about the Baroque era. I'm not sure what I'll be doing next, but hopefully I'll be continuing this series. And I'm pretty sure that I will not be in Perugia anymore uh, when, by the time this video goes rolling out. But I hope that you found the video interesting. And as usual, I hope that it inspires you to make your own little art explorations. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Ciao.